So in the following videos we will look a little bit at join algorithms. Join algorithms are super important for query processing. So just like B trees are super important for indexing, join algorithms are one of the most fundamental things to know about. And, and there are many applications for join algorithms. Well, one is just implementing joins, relational joins themselves. That's trivial, of course, but there are many others. Once you understand join algorithms, you can also easily adapt them to implement stuff like intersect or accept or group by basically uses the same techniques. So whether it has a having statement or not, everything that works well for joins can also easily be adapted to implement group by operations. And then of course subqueries, we will see that later on in other videos, subqueries you use in your SQL statement can often be rewritten to a join condition, to a join, which is then again executed by this join operation. So there are basically four principal classes of join algorithms. What are those classes? Well, the first is nested loop. That is what this video is about. Then the second is index nested loop. We will also get back to that in this video. The third is hash, anything that is hash based. And here we will reuse everything we already learned about hash tables and hash maps. And then there's a fourth class that is sort based. So here we somehow sort the data and merge it. So for all of those principal classes of join algorithms, there exist many, many variants and we will only look at some of them. So we will focus on the most important ones. And we will start with nested loop, which is really a trivial algorithm. Anyway, I show it for completeness here. So what is nested loop join? We have two input relations, R and S, and we want to join them using a specific join condition. This join condition is defined by a so-called join predicate. That is what is shown here. So JP R comma S. So that's the join predicate. It takes a tuple of R and a tuple of S as its input. And then it returns true if and only if the values of those two attributes are the same. So I assume here that both relations have an attribute X. R has an attribute X and S has an attribute X. And only if the values of those two tuples are equal with respect to the attribute X, then this predicate will return true. This is how the join predicate is defined. This is of course an equijoin. We had that already in the undergrad lecture when talking about join processing. So how is this processed in a nested loop join? It's really easy. We start with a signature of this nested loop join method. So this is a function call to nested loop join. We need as input relation R and relation S and we need the join predicate, of course. The algorithm is really easy. It uses two loops. That is why it is called nested loop. So two loop, one is nested. One loops over all tuples from R and one loops over all tuples from S. And within this nested loop, the algorithm simply calls the join predicate. So it checks whether that join predicate holds. And if that is the case, it returns an output. That is the output that is returned. So tuple R and S somehow combined, this is written to the output. So for the moment, let's fully ignore how this output is implemented. So here I just assume this is a function call and somewhere there, the output tuples are collected. It doesn't matter for the moment. Similarly, we don't have to pass R and S materialized as copies in main memory. So there are many ways on how to handle the data. We don't look at that for the moment. The only thing I'm assuming here is that there's some way to somehow iterate over the tuples of R and that's the same way, in the same way I can iterate over the tuples of S. So what you see here, already is. So this is basically like doing the cross product of R and S, if you remember relational algebra, and then applying the selection condition outside. So here we materialize this cross product basically in the algorithm, which has square complexity because we have, if this is a number of tuples in R times the number of tuples in S comparisons. If you assume that both have the same size. Let's do that for the moment. Let's assume both have the same size. So we have something like R equals S 
let's call that n. This means we have a square complexity, basically, in terms of the number of comparisons. And this is, of course, a problem for a larger input. So if you only have a few dozen or few hundred tuples on the left and on the right input, well, then it doesn't matter too much. But the bigger those inputs become, the more you will have a CPU problem here in this algorithm, definitely. So this is nested loop join. This is a join that always works. So one important observation here is, of course, this join predicate doesn't have to expose its implementation. So here we don't really have to know the tuples are compared with respect to their, to their x attributes. It would be really easy here, for example, to say something like that, r dot x smaller equal s dot x. Uh, let's call this jp2 r comma s. So that's our second variant of a joint predicate. And if you use that here, it's no problem. This join just works out of the box. No matter how this join predicate is implemented, no matter how it is defined, as long as it makes, I mean, it should make some meaningful reference to the input tuples R and S, of course. But basically, this works out of the box, which means nested loop join can always be applied. This is something that always works not only for equijoins like here, but also for other conditions. And this is not necessarily true for other join algorithms. Okay, so this is nested loop join. Keep this in mind, be careful with this. However, it works in many situations, especially for small inputs and for arbitrary join predicates. This is a great choice. So there's a variant of nested loop join that is called index nested loop join. Here we have slightly different preconditions. We not only have the join predicate, here it's an equijoin predicate again, but there's also already an index available on one of the inputs. So that is what is depicted here. Here I can ask the database catalog to return me an index on this attribute x. So this call only makes sense if there is an index that is referred to in the join predicate. So here in the equijoin predicate, I'm comparing the values of the x attributes of r and s. I can run this algorithm either if I have an index on this attribute of relation r or on that attribute on relation s. So they happen to have the same names, but even if it's whatever, if it's r dot a equals s dot b, if I have an index on r dot a or an index on s dot b, this algorithm can be applied. So there has to be an index on one of the attributes I use in the comparison. And that is what I do here. So I have a function call that returns me that index and now this handle points to this index. So this is an index on attribute rx. And that is the precondition for this join algorithm. Such an index has to be available. So now I can call the join algorithm, and that's what I do here. Notice that I do not pass relation r here as a parameter. I just pass this handle to the index, then relation s again, and the join predicate. And then there's only one loop. That is the loop over s. And what I do is, for every tuple of s, I run a query against that index. That is what is depicted here. So here's the index, there's a query method, a point query, so to say, this is a point query, point query. You can also do that with range queries in special situations. That's another story. For the moment, assume it's point queries. And what I do is I take this attribute value x of this tuple I'm currently looking at and I use it as a query. So I want to have all tuples of R that have the same value in the x attribute as this tuple s I'm currently passing to this method. So if this is, let's say, for this specific tuple, if this is 42, so then this function call will return those tuples of relation r that have the value 42 appearing in their attribute x. That is the idea. So what I obtain here is a result set, and then I can check whether that is empty or not. If it's empty, I don't have to do anything because no result is generated. However, if it's not empty, I have to output something. And that's basically the cross product of tuple s I'm currently checking with the query result set. So here the index 
will return all tuples that have that value, all tuples of R that have this same value, say 42. So this may be a set. And then what I return is simply the cross product of this set and S. So whatever the size of this result set, the size of the partial output that is generated is equal to that. So again, we use this notation. Let's say the size of the query result set, let's say is whatever, seven. Then of course, the cross product of this with this tuple is again seven, yeah, this partial result. So S cross product, query result set number of tuples is of course seven again. Yeah, and so for each tuple of S that is passed to the query method here, some additional query results may be generated. And this means only after having probed all of those tuples here from S, then I obtain the final result. So notice here, we are probing this index that was already built in the previous phase. So only after having probed all of those values of tuples of S with the index of R, then I'm done, then I obtain the final result. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.